Parker. And welcome back. I hope you got some good coffee that you're all warmed up and, and ready to go. Um, before we start, a friend of mine uh, shared a, a wonderful joke that I think is is of some value in this discussion. He said that, uh, you know, there was a a engineer, a physicist, and a mathematician uh, that were all staying a night in a hotel. And in each of their rooms, the bed caught fire. And the uh, engineer went and grabbed the fire extinguisher and just soaked his whole bed, got everything down. And, and uh, it, you know, of course survived, but didn't have a place to sleep. The physicist, uh, on, upon discovering the fire on half of his bed, went and quickly did calculations, grabbed the, the uh, extinguisher, and precisely only put out the fire, just got it exactly all the angles exactly right and fell asleep on the other half of the bed and was fine. Um, the mathematician got up, noticed the fire, and he looked and he said, there is a solution, and then died in the fire. Um, it shows three different attitudes that we can have towards things based on our sort of academic relationship to something. And I think uh, it, it does show us kind of the way that some people react to the pseudoepigraphic pseudo works or other things, you know, the engineer goes, ah, I'm not, again, not to malign engineers, ah, it's not necessary, chuck it all out. Maybe the physicist, uh, you know, looks more precisely and takes care of it. And then the mathematician goes, I don't know, it's just a thing. So uh, I would, uh, or, you know, that there's, there is some solution here. And it's difficult because as we know, we don't know everything. Uh, some of us probably may not even be familiar with uh, the book of um, uh, the book of Jubilees at all, right? It seems like uh, Enoch gets more of the uh, more of the attention in the whole in the grander scheme of things. Um, but um, honestly, sorry. Uh, but we want to point out that uh, that when we're looking at this stuff, we we don't want to react too hastily again towards you know like just going in wholesale on all this stuff. Nor do we want to uh, be so aloof that we don't consider it all go, well, that's an interesting thing. And then just move on. Uh, hopefully we'll kind of hit that middle ground of the, of the physicist and the joke and uh, be able to uh, evaluate these things and take, draw forth the interesting points um, and also gain uh, that discernment and have that discernment to know not to allow extra biblical documents to dictate um, our beliefs, particularly on the rather difficult subject of angels, because we rely wholly on revelation. There's no kind of scientific level of study that we could do to confirm this. So um, moving into the Book of Jubilees, we'll look at a little bit of background on it. Let me hear. Oh, let's see. Um, there we are. Um, we ask, what is, first of all, a Jubilee? But again, we may or may not have even heard of this book. Um, but when we think of the Jubilee, this is a biblical concept. This is something that the Lord um, made. And this, here's just Erdman's Bible Dictionary. I think they describe it well. It says, the 50th year in a series of seven sabbatical years. The year of Jubilee, from Hebrew, Yobel, Ramshorn, is a last late layer in the extension of the Sabbath principle that begins with the day of rest every seventh day. Extended in the sabbatical year, fallow every seventh year to the Jubilee. It begins in the middle of the 70th sabbatical year, every 49th year, and on the 10th day of the seventh month, the Day of Atonement, and extends presumably uh, into the seventh month of the 50th year, thus overlapping by just over a half a year with a regular sabbatical year. A ram's horn was used to sound or was sounded throughout the land. And the Jubilee proclaimed, during which uh, land was to be restored to its original inherited line of ownership, an Israelite debt, debt, free, uh, debt slaves freed to return to their own land. The Jubilee year, like the sabbatical year, was a, to be a year of rest for the land in which sowing, reaping, and harvesting were permitted or prohibited. The redemption price of the land or slave was to be prorated according to the number of years left until the next Jubilee. These Jubilee laws are detailed exclusively in Leviticus 25, not being mentioned in the parallel legislation of Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 15. Or the covenant code in Exodus 21, 2 through 4. Conversely, no mention is made in Leviticus 25 of the cancellation of debts mandated in De Deuteronomy 15, perhaps because this cancellation was predicted upon the charging of interest, whereas interest is prohibited outright in Leviticus 25, 35 through 38. Through later tradition, consistently, though later tradition consistently connects these provisions, nor does Leviticus 25 mention the seventh year release of the seven year release of debt slaves. 
Though the methods prescribed in verses 47 through 53 for this calculation of redemption price necessarily assumes it. The calculation only working when the Jubilee should happen to intervene with normal six-year period of servitude, perhaps secondarily edited out uh, to emphasize a political point about release from Babylon, exile, Babylon and exile after 50 years of captivity. So here's our, our Charlie Day uh, picture again, right? Uh, this is an interesting book because it is written based upon uh, by at a uh, undoubtedly much later date, right, than the Mosaic uh, period. But it's written by someone who uh, essentially a, probably a well-meaning uh, uh, believer who saw this structure of time. He saw how God had structured, and we 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 noticed this as well, right? Our our um, our weeks are structured into seven days, and that is based solely upon the decree of God. Our years have to do with kind of the solar cycle and the earth going around the sun, our days and nights and seasons, right? We can see those uh, by the by the moon. So we see all these celestial bodies working as the Lord designed them to give us signs and seasons. And also uh, the Lord gives us uh, what are apparently arbitrary, that is to say they're not seemingly rooted in any physiological features, things like seven days. And as we see, seven-year periods were very common throughout the biblical biblical thinking in the ancient, ancient world of Israel, right? So as a good, for instance, or a good example, when uh, Jacob goes to serve Laban for his daughters. It seems that seven years is an appropriate time. That's just the accepted time that they that he's going to serve them for. Um, so there's that picture of that uh, completeness in that time period. <clears throat> and the author of Jubilees, it appears, takes us into this next, uh, takes that to the next level and says, if that's how God wanted to organize time, then we simply have to go backwards and we can count everything out and measure all time in terms of jubilees. That's one of God's kind of units of measurement. Um, and with a more rational perspective, we would say, well, not necessarily. He established the the, the law of jubilees, certainly, with meaning for the Jewish people to uh, do important things within their society to help kind of uh, keep things balanced and level to make sure that the they didn't uh, the various land inheritance didn't all wind up being collected by one family or one conglomerate and so it had many values as well as uh, preserving you know freedom and and putting limitations on you know the trouble a person could kind of come into financially there was just lots of value to it but we have to admit it's taking quite a big leap to try to measure all time by jubilees and it's kind of a, a, a like a class 1 conspiracy theorist move right you find something and then you try to connect it up just a little bit more tightly or a lot more tightly in this case and that's what we get with the book of jubilees is a a, a nice retelling of and it kind of falls into that category of one of these uh, targumim, these, these retellings of biblical accounts and biblical stories, usually with some interpretation, oftentimes inserting details that uh, may or may not be genuine or correct, you know, details to insert, but that to answer questions, usually the theological questions that come up. So uh, it is difficult to say whether those were traditionally passed down in this case, or whether they are the interpretive choices of the author, right? Uh, but regardless, we have to recognize that even if they are legitimate, legitimate suggestions for ways to relieve tension or perhaps added drama to certain biblical texts that we cannot say that they are of uh, scriptural authority. I just can't say this enough because it's so easy to see people kind of fall into exactly this difficulty and say, oh, Jubilees, that's the key to everything, and then sit down with a pencil and paper and try to map out every day since then and find out which Jubilee we're in. And then we're going to find out if we count out so many Jubilees, that's what's going to bring us to our knowledge of that. Because it always seems to wrap up into, you know, we're going to discover what date the end of the world is or what date the end of the rapture is coming or whatever it is. And uh, it seems to be to be the fact that they often over always overlook that the lord told us that we're not going to know the day of the hour we're not going to know it's not for us to know the times and the seasons in that regard so um uh, any amount of ingenuity on our part is by no means going to belie the revelation given to us by the very mouth of the son of god um so 
With that in mind, we look to James C. Vanderkam. Again, I said one of the foremost, truly excellent scholars on these topics uh, and the one probably worth looking into if you're going to look to someone. Uh, I would not, not look to many more, most people on the popular scene, uh, but he's got some really good information and really thoughtful way of approaching it. He says, the book of Jubilees is a narrative work by a Jewish author who composed it in Hebrew around the middle of the second century BC. In it, he refrains, reframed and rewrote the book of Genesis and the first parts of the book of Exodus. His sec second edition, as it were, of the stories of the creation to Sinai has the distinction of being the oldest sustained commentary of the Genesis to Exodus narratives. It was probably written before there was a separated community of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it was influential for that group and he eventually for some other Jewish and Christian writers. So we see that Jubilees has had uh, some significant historical impact. And uh, anytime you're studying through Genesis, uh, that that one, as well as the book of Jasher's, at least the, the more legitimate one that we have, um, are definitely interesting to consider in light of those events. Um, maybe not, again, for better factual information, but for uh, an understanding of what particularly the Judaism in the second century or second temple period, that is the period after the return from exile, would have uh, up through the destruction of the temple at 70 AD, might have, uh, how they might have viewed, or at least information that they would have viewed as, as being interesting or valid. So <clears throat> this uh, book is divided into two major sections. The first section is the setting and purpose, and the second is the balance of the book. So the work is comprised of 50 chapters, which are separated into the two major sections, the first section being comprised of only the first chapter and the second being the balance of the book. But in this way, the first section is a sort of introduction that supplies the needed information to understand the explanation the angel gives to Moses, giving him information from creation to Mount Sinai. It can be clearly seen how this book would supply the information every reader of Genesis naturally will wonder, where did Moses get his information? There have been plenty of other uh, adequate theories from the Toledot theory to the thought that God himself revealed those things to Moses as they shared fellowship in the tabernacle, but this book expressly assigns that work to angelic agency. This point and more make Jubilees the second major or the the first book that we're going to look at today, um, as it has uh, a lot of interesting points and particularly shows that the angelology of the Bible was uh, certainly understood. And even if they took it beyond what the biblical text has to say, uh, I think we'll argue that they had a, a fairly largely consistent view if they didn't simply add things that were consistent with what was already given, right? And that's probably one of the big distinctions that at least I look for as I look through these books. I'm going to ask, does this contradict with the biblical doctrine of angels, what the Bible says about God, angels, and God's plan? Or does this information uh, simply supply extra information within the framework of that? So it doesn't necessarily contradict, but it... Um, but it fills in gaps, right? And we would, of course, not make the the the, res the conclusions. We would not think them authoritative when they supply extra information. But we want to be mindful of the fact uh, that uh, that those cultural observations or historical observations, if they're not in conflict with scripture, can at least be considered as thoughtful supply of of, of thought or information uh, that we may be interested in. So with that, we're going to look at Jubilees 1, 27 through 29. Don't turn to it in your Bibles because it's not in your Bibles. Do I need to say it again? This is not scripture, uh, but it is uh, uh, some interest, of some interest to us. So reading, it says, then he told the angel of the presence to dictate to Moses, starting from the beginning of creation until the time when my temple is built upon them throughout the ages of eternity, the Lord will appear in the sight of them of all and will know that I am the God of Israel, the father of all Jacob's children, the king on the Mount, on Mount Zion for the ages of eternity. Then Zion and Jerusalem will be holy. The angel of the presence who was going along in front of the Israelite camp uh, took the the tablets that told of the divisions of the years and from the time of the law and the testimony were created for the weeks of their jubilees year by year and their full number and their jubilees from the time of the first creation until the time of the new creation and the heavens and the earth and their creatures will be renewed like the powers in the sky of the sky and like all the creatures of the earth until the time when the temple of the Lord will be created in Jerusalem on Mount Zion all the luminaries will be renewed for the purpose of healing health and blessing for all the elect ones 
in the, of Israel, and so that it may remain this way from the time through that time throughout all of the days of the earth. Okay, so there's a lot of really interesting information here. First of all, the picture of the angel of the presence being this name for this angel that's leading the people and, and seemingly meeting with Moses on behalf of God in this uh, interpretation. Again, we see that um, this is the positing that the, this angelic agency is how Moses got the information to write the uh, uh, um, write the, the law, basically, and uh, the supply said information. We also note that there's regular uh, reference to the temple, right? And Second Temple Judaism was definitely uh, fixed on this idea and fixated on this idea that there, the temple had an important place in history, and that's not without reason, right? We have the book of Ezekiel talking about the millennial temple, this future temple that's going to be uh, on the earth in the millennial period uh, of, of incredible magnitude and, and you know, from which Messiah reigns and all that business. Uh, so we notice there that uh, the anachronism is that Moses really didn't give any for information about a temple. He was given information about the tabernacle. So interestingly, this is a seemingly an attempt to legitimize the temple as the new place. Not that it needs legitimization. Obviously, the temple is a, is a part of God's plan in his time, right? Uh, David asks God if he can build it, and, and David is denied that because he's a man of war. And Solomon, who is a man of peace, is then um, allowed or, or pointed to that task. And um, the Lord has interesting, you know, saying all these times I've been traveling around in a tent, and I haven't asked you for a temple. And yet it seems to be, uh, uh, certainly is, not seems to be, certainly is a part of God's plan to see the established temple placed in Jerusalem on that temple on that temple mount as an access point to God uh, that movement from a, a tabernacle a movable tent to a stationary fixed temple right becomes important Jesus Christ himself appears in the temple and legitimizes the temple uh, in that regard as well as again the historical context so if you want to read a great book on um, on the temple uh, as a as a study there's a wonderful book by a uh, Randy Price uh, on the topic that I highly recommend. Um, but we want to note here that this Second Temple author is trying to or hoping to, again, whether with good intent or ill, but seemingly good intent, trying to point out that, hey, no, 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 this tabernacle goes, you know, goes this tent. So this this tabernacle is a prefigure for the temple, but the temple was always the goal kind of the thing, kind of a thing. And Moses knew that, right? Uh, and we see this a lot actually in the pseudographic writings, uh, trying to read back the the maybe we might say the dictates or the commands or the expectations of the law or the sabbath whatever it is into um into the pre-law period into israel's history right so basically kind of trying to say well it's, it's true this this law is has all these dictates decrees and, and instruction about living for israel and they just want to push all that back and assume that it was always happening uh, as such but we see that's not the case progressive revelation gives us a better understanding of what's going on and that's that god is continually revealing himself and his plan and so when he put the law into place or put the jubilees into place whatever else it is uh, we don't need to try to read that back and find that in the early chapters of Genesis or assume that it was somewhere orally and then it was just codified, um, there's, there's just no reason to do that. Interestingly, right, the covenant of super, uh, circumcision uh, precedes the law as a, as a command given as a part of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and then is recodified into the law, but we don't need to assume that that happened for every other thing, such as you know the eating of clean and unclean animals. That was something that started with the law of Moses amongst the Jewish people, um, and, and on and on and on. Uh, so the the uh, our, our writer here is trying to do that specifically with uh, the the idea of jubilees with this very eschatological intent of of legitimizing what had happened going forward. So again, not negative intent for sure by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, uh, something that is interesting also that they look for this time of new creation when the heavens and the earth and their creatures are renewed and the powers of the sky and all the creatures of the earth. And also this fascinating second temple era idea that somehow the change or the renewal of the lights will bring about uh, increased prosperity and health as if somehow the sin had affected you know, maybe through the flood or something else affected the quality and speed of light that was somehow now damaging to humans' health. But whatever the case, I don't know. I do believe that there will be no sunburns in heaven. So it's for what it's worth. All right. 
Let's look at what uh, Vanderkam has to say in his, his excellent commentary. He's got wonderful two volume commentaries that he wrote with, uh, with I think he wrote this on his, his own and then did the Enoch commentaries with Nicholsburg. But uh, he says in reference to this, he says, now uh, the Lord now turns to the angel of the presence who made his first appearance in the book. By definition, such an angel would be nearby. So God needed only to turn to him when he finished with Moses. No further words of description for the angel figure here, though in verse 29, some helpful details about him are being are divulged. The title does not appear uh, in the whole HB, but Isaiah 39, 6 or 63, 9 appears to come closest. Literally, the angel of his presence saved them. The expression is problematic, and the Septuagint reads differently. No angel, but God Himself, saves them. Yet, in the present, uh, in uh, yeah, First Q Isaiah, and the thus an old Hebrew reading, the exact title appears in several texts from the Qumran caves. So that's those Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way. Whether this is in the singular. Uh, or in the plural. Jubilees itself provides evidence for the supreme status of angels in this class. In 2.2, they are listed as the first of the angels to be created. In 2.18, the angels of the presence with the angels of holiness are singled out from the other classes of angels and given privilege to keeping of keeping the Sabbath of the Lord in heaven and on earth. Jubilees 15.27 says they were created uh, circumcised. So, this is an interesting uh, picture. And, and another thing that we see a lot in the pseudo-epigraphic literature is, as I said, it's answering questions or attempting to answer questions that are left to us uh, in the spaces of scripture. So what are we so interested in? Well, the creation of angels. That's very fascinating to us. How are they created? What was that process like? And the uh, pseudo-epigraphic works try to supply answers. Again, not biblically uh, guaranteed answers, uh, biblically certified answers, uh, but they are fascinating you know, thoughts that are put forth in the, in the gap. So uh, the angel of the presence appears to be the special class of angel in the context of the, of the book of Jubilees and brings to our mind the statement of Gabriel and Zechariah, uh, Gabriel to Zechariah in Luke 119. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring these glad tidings. So I don't know that that's a reference in any way. In fact, it's, since it's Gabriel speaking, I tend to think not particularly, um, but it is a fascinating parallel uh, to draw that this idea of the angels who stand in God's presence have that special access and place with him are of a different class or order, perhaps even uh, just uh, assignment, uh, but certainly are worthy of special honor in that, that thinking. It seems that the special class of angel may even be equated with the place and fall, uh, with the fall of Satan. His fall may easily be equated as the biblical designation archangel. The next noticeable fact from these verses is the function of the angel of presence as an instrument of revelation. In fact, the rest of the book is going to be brought through this angel's telling of the events to Moses and Moses' consequent recording of each of the events. Uh, well, yeah, as a part of it. So this is kind of where we see the thought of Acts 7.38 that it was handed to Moses by angels. While this event is nowhere recorded in scripture, the function of an angel being used to bring and provide revelation is a regular and biblical function throughout the Old Testament. While the angel uh, angelic designation is not found in the biblical texts, clearly, as we saw that it was at least alluded to in Isaiah, especially in the Qumran uh, copies that we have. Uh, but the similarity of title and function displays the basic angelic orthodoxy and its most well-founded pseudopographic authors. So again, we see this picture of a, a group of people, that, however they're ascertaining this information, whether they're writing this sort of as a, as a commentary or a style of what we would call a commentary, um, uh, that they are uh, certainly supplying information that is not native to the Bible after a point, but in a case like this, we see that it's not totally objectionable in its quality, even if it is a bit novel uh, to us on our behalf. So what do we see in this? We see a picture of angelic uh, agency, both in terms of the uh, hierarchy of angels, that they have specific jobs and roles, and the greatest designation that one can have is to exist in the presence of the Lord is to be in the presence of the Lord. And uh, also that focus and function of bringing down information and giving, disseminating and explaining uh, to humans what it is that God wants. So if we're you know, on the thumbs up, thumb down scale, 
We're saying that there's a interesting extra new information added here, um, but it, it is not in direct conflict or contradiction to large by and large with anything we see. With that, we can move on to Jubilee one two or two one two one. On the Lord's orders, the angel of the presence said to Moses, "Write all the words about the creation. How on the sixth day the Lord God completed all His works, everything that He created, and kept Sabbath for on the seventh day. He sanctified it for all ages and set it as a sign for all works." all his works. On the first day, he created the heavens that are above, the earth, the waters, and all the spirits who serve him, namely the angels of the presence, the angels of holiness, the angels of the spirit of fire, the angels of the winds that blow, the angels of the clouds for darkness, ice, hoarfrosts, dew, snow, hail, and frost, and angels of, uh, of the thunder, and for the angels of the winds, and the angels of the spirits for cold and heat, for winter and summer, and for all the spirits of his creatures that he made, and the heavens that he made on the earth, and in every place, there were, also, there were also the depths, darkness, and dawn, light and evening that he prepared through his knowledge. Then we saw that his works were blessed him, uh, works and blessed him regarding all his works. We offered praise before we, right, the angels, offered praise before him because he had made seven great works on the first day. So again, just like before, he's taking the biblical text and giving this uh, uh, more information and explanation. And what is he doing? He's telling us when angels or he believes angels were um, created. Uh, and that's on this first day, right? So he inserts that there, which is certainly one of the uh, many theories that are going actively today. People would wonder when the angelic world was created. Was it before our time scale began? Is it out aside of our time scale in eternity? Was it within the context of that first day? And so this idea, and it's really interesting how specific he gets about each of these angelic uh, creations and their purpose. You notice he assigns angels to, to most phenomena that occur on earth, such as hail and frost and wind and dew and hoarfrost and ice. This is not uncommon in the ancient world. The idea that um, that, that the Lord through angels is um, doing every phenomena or every phenomenal action. There's just, there's an angel who makes it snow and there's an angel who makes it windy and there's an angel who makes it cold uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the problem, the challenge with this, at least, or one challenge that we would see to this is that many of these phenomena weren't likely to take place until after the fall, even more so until after the uh, the flood, right? When things changed very significantly. Uh, so uh, while we don't, uh, I certainly wouldn't be so quick to to attack, accept this idea in, in its entirety. Uh, we do see that, as we mentioned before, that the Old Testament does talk about special instances wherein the uh, angels either appear or cause certain phenomena in terms of, you know, weather and astrology. So, you know, things they see in the sky, so forth. Uh, so again, a point of interest. But the other point of interest is, again, this uh, just this idea of categories of angels. So we have the angels of presence, holiness, spirits of fire, winds that blow, clouds of darkness, precipitation, cold and heat, winter and summer, right? So um, we also want to just stop and pause for a minute and say, hey, wait a minute. Did you just confirm the literal seven 24-hour days of creation? Yes, absolutely, he did. Right, that was ab that was a hundred percent the uh, orthodox thinking of the time. There was no thought of days and ages. There was no thought of you know millions of years or anything like that. It was absolutely a, a belief that the the Lord literally cre created the earth in a literal uh, seven day period. So the Jewish people, uh, again, as we understand, this is the accepted under uh, understanding of the Jewish people of their own scripture from the very beginning, from the earliest days of. Judaism and on into the Second Temple period. However, it also provides additional information that answers questions which interpreters have ever been asked. When were the celestial creatures created, right? So we see that all of these different uh, creatures, uh, kinds, and classes of angels become important. And that also, as we see, is a biblically valid idea. Even if we don't see these biblical, these specific uh, categories of in, of uh, celestial being in the world, we do see that there are categories of different types, roles, jobs, um, uh, we might say, of angels, a function of angels, um, and points out the reality. So weather, seasons, every other factor out of human control is assigned to angelic control. So um, we, we see that there is validity, biblical validity to the idea that there are different classes of angels, but there is also a uh, biblical 
or a, a conflict, we might say, with the idea that everything that happens is absolutely uh, related to that, uh, related to angelic movement or angelic work. Um, I guess you would have to say it's not necessarily an impossibility, but it just doesn't match. It seems that that is external or exter external to the biblical text, certainly, and probably with some reason to think. Uh, Revelation 9, 13 through 14 supplies a similar perspective. It says, then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four angels of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had sounded the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So this idea of angels affecting and being involved with natural phenomenon is not a uh, totally uh, broken or not totally alien or foreign to biblical thinking, but the extremity to which this is brought certainly uh, far surpasses uh, the, the biblical revelation on the topic. But again, we see, and, and part of the reason why we want to in, engage in this kind of study is to find out not just... Um, you know, what does the Bible teach, but how did the people, how did most people understand or how did the original recipients or even the descendants of the original recipients understand these things and what, uh, you know, other potentially creative ideas or, or legitimate ideas did they have about it? So uh, gives us background. All right. Moving into Jubilees 3, 17 through 22. When the conclusion of the seven years, which he had uh, completed there arrived, seven years exactly, in the second month, on the 17th, the serpent came and approached the woman. The serpent said to the woman, is it from all the fruit of the trees of the garden that the Lord has commanded you? Do not eat from it. She said to him, from all the fruit of the trees that are in the garden of the Lord told us, eat. But from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, he told us, do not eat from it and do not touch it so that you may not die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not really die because the Lord knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like gods and you will know good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was delightful and pleasing to the eye and its fruit was good to eat. She took some of it and ate. Her, she first covered her shame with fig leaves and then gave it to Adam. He ate and his eyes were opened and he saw him uh, that he was naked. He took fig leaves and sewed them. Thus, he made himself an apron and covered his shame. So <clears throat> this is obviously a, a retelling of Genesis chapter three uh, and, and the, uh, the temptation at the hands of the serpent. He doesn't give us any information to try to uh, determine that serpent's identity any more than the uh, biblical text does. But we see that there's a strange alteration in the order of the some things that occur uh, that are contrary to the biblical text. In the book of Jubilees, Eve eats, covers herself, and then gives to Adam. Whereas in the biblical account, this strongly intimates very strongly that they ate together, that she ate and she gave to her husband, the text says, with her, who was with her, the idea being that he had been with her uh, from the beginning, that Eve was not, uh, Eve was the particular target of the serpent's discussion, but Adam wasn't absent from her. And I think there's good reason to believe that because if you were Adam, the first man in the garden with Eve, the first woman, why would you ever be apart from her? Like, of course he's going to be with her. He's not going to go anywhere. She's beautiful and wonderful, and he wants to be with her. So the idea that he was with her the whole time, but abdicated his leadership role by allowing her to have this conversation and not interfering in it, even though he knew that the serpent was uh, giving false information, uh, was important. Most importantly, to the purpose of this study, the account confirms the ability of fallen celestial beings to possess and inhabit other forms as it accepts the same... Uh, presuppositions of, of scripture is, is accepts the same presentation of that as scripture. It agrees fully with the text of scripture about the nature of some rebel or angel angelic being that caused Eve to question the goodness and trustworthiness of the provisions and commandments of God. It also does show that sort of, uh, desire in in um, Jewish theology and really a lot of Christian traditional Christian theology to make sure that more of the blame gets put onto Eve than the text uh, allows or the text really justifies. I think that's really a, a fascinating tendency and trend and uh, it's hilarious because what do we see when Adam is confronted by the Lord? He says, well, it was that woman you put me here with, right? 
<laughs> and uh, it's fascinating because I think there's a subtle condemnation of a failure in masculinity of biblical leadership in that uh, movement of shifting of blame. And it's interesting to me that um, we're still doing it, <laughs> that even the biblical text was to try to like justify that accusation or not the biblical text, sorry, these extra biblical texts want to justify that explanation anymore by trying to clarify that she ate, she covered her shame, and then she walked up and, you know, maybe she said, <laughs> Aren't you going to compliment my dress? I don't know. But whether he did, she did or didn't, uh, it's a really fascinating, you know, retelling of the account that separates the the sexes in their relationship to the guilt uh, that goes on, uh, goes on there. Um, but aside for uh, perhaps another time of, of discussion, because we are not here to discuss um, gender issues in these books. <laughs> We're here to discuss angels in these books. Here's Jubilee 415. During the second week of the 10th Jubilee, 449 to 455, Malalel, Mama Malalel. Ooh, what a great name. Can you imagine being Malalel? Almost. Anyway, married Dina, the daughter of uh, Barakiel, the daughter of his father's brother. She gave birth to a son for him in the third week. In its sixth year, he named him Jared because during his lifetime, the angels of the Lord who were called watchers descended to the earth to teach humanity and to do what is just and upright upon the earth. Um, so this is a, a really uh, fascinating uh, realization or point, and it will be made uh, more than once in the context of our study of both this and Enoch, which is what is the deal with these watchers? What do they come from? What are they about? What are they doing? And what was their role in that uh, Genesis 6 through 9 period? That is to say, we know that they violated God's uh, expectations, but what uh, were they there to do? And was it good or nefarious, right? And so this passage affirms that there was a time when angelic beings known as the watchers came down with the purpose of teaching humanity. The difference between this and the other accounts is that the substance of the inter inter instruction was meant to be good and positive, whereas Enoch describes the inter interference to be entirely negative in light. Vanderkam elucidates the differences in this nice explanation. It says, by, uh, excuse me, by way of the son's name, Jared, share, name sharing the consonants of the Hebrew vow, verb meaning went down, the author introduces the story of the angels who descended here called watchers as in 1 Enoch 6.2. The same play on the meaning of Jared's name occurs in 1 Enoch 6.6. 6. Where, however, the angels go down to the earth for a different reason than the one given in Jubilees. The writer mentions the story at this point, will develop, but will develop it in chapter 5. The statement about the meaning of Jared's name is exceptionally important. His father so named him because during his lifetime, angels of the Lord, who were called watchers, descended on the earth to teach humanity and to do what is just and right upright upon the earth. For Jubilees, in distinction from the traditions represented in First Enoch, the angels' descent was a positive event that they, they then came into a teaching mission and a model righteous behavior only at a latter time and upon the earth did problems arise. So the angels did not become sinful in their heavenly home prior to their descent, as they probably did according to Enoch 6, 2, 12, 4, and 15, 3. That happens only after they left it. The reputation of heaven thus remains intact. So this interpretation hits squarely at the theological truth with regard to the way the Lord would allow such diabolical interference, right? I mean, this is where, again, I would point out that my my theory about the progressive fall of or rebellion of the angelic hosts as we see it uh, was not a one-time event. Of course, again, it's not uh, just to say that it wasn't a unique idea. It rose out of uh, looking at these texts. Um yeah, so, uh, sorry. So it gives us a, it gives us this explanation and and the uh, also the understanding of how the angels would have been present and involved and invested and uh, then give them an opportunity to be swayed or fallen uh, by de demons or something else. So the text makes the watchers out to be positive figures until such time as they are corrupted by the beauty of the sons and, or the beauty of the daughters and the sons of men and the desire to interact with them sexually, making a progeny for themselves among, upon the earth. So. As we see this this picture, right, the the uniform Jewish idea being that there was 
interaction with angels uh, during this time. And it really is interesting, at least to me, to see this uh, sort of disjunction, because we're going to see that Jubilees, uh, the book of Jubilees, the author of the book of Jubilees, demonstrates, um, what would you call it, D demonstrates familiarity with the book of Enoch as well as uh, confirmation, or he confirms it. It doesn't provide for us confirmation, but it just says that he was knowledgeable about it. And he, this author also um, seemed to, to find it to be in, in that some way uh, authoritative to his discussion, I guess is the right way to say that. Um, but this picture of this period wherein the Lord sent down or allowed angels to come to earth in order to instruct humanity on how to live, um, again, is not uh, clearly elucidated in scripture, but it does give us an interesting food for thought as to what they were doing and how that mission uh, fell apart and was corrupted. And eventually, it, essentially, the, the first they were meant to teach and prepare good things, that it was some sort of really revelation upon the earth so that man would have an idea as to how God intended him to act and, and you know, live and move. Uh, and then that uh, mission was, again, uh, somehow corrupted and failed in that topic. So again, it's it's certainly confirmation for the idea or the the biblical concept that the sons of God were indeed angels that came down and um it doesn't highlight as much the problems with that but it shows us that this is still the original interpretation the ancient the most ancient interpretation and understanding. With that, we move ahead to Jubilees 4, 21 and 22. It says, he was moreover with God's angels for six Jubilees of years. They showed him everything on earth and in the heavens, this dominion of the sun, and he wrote down everything. He testified to the watchers who had sinned with the daughters of men who had begun the mix to mix with earthly women so that they became defiled. Enoch testified against all of them. So, here is that, as we mentioned, these verses are uh, account for the experience of Enoch and are a statement the author of Jubilees regarded the Enochian account as reliable and authoritative. The time that Enoch spent with the angels is said to be 294 years. That's six Jubilees of 49 years each. And this would give Enoch time after the event to write down his revelations uh, before he was no more. He was taken to be with the Lord. This affirms the idea that there is an angelic realm that by a divine agency accessible to at least least one person, Enoch. Those years were allegedly spent by Enoch learning about the hierarchy of celestial beings and the various sins and destinies of the unseen spiritual world. This premise goes beyond what is contained in the text of the Old Testament, but is also in keeping with the revelation of uh, contained in the Jacob's Ladder vision, as well as the visions of Isaiah and Ezekiel. So the idea that there is an unseen spiritual realm and there's, there's uh, some uh, you know intercourse between the two, that things you know people or rather angels come to and fro. They they leave and enter. And uh, as uh, David and I were talking this morning, how fascinating it is, right? That when uh, the angel had to come down and or came down to deliver his message of encouragement uh, to Daniel, that the prince of Persia was able to keep him or halt him. So there's this picture of him like entering into Earth's ge geography somewhere and trying to get to another generation, which you know, from our thinking, it's like, well, why not just zap down right where you're needed? Evidently, that's uh, not the way it works from what we can tell. And this gives us more uh, of a picture of that kind of uh, that kind of thinking as being an accepted reality or worldview that's put forth. Again, here we also see that whether, whether these documents were um, uh, written in the second temple period or merely finalized in the second period, there was a sort of mutual recognition of what other things that were written were. And again, that they certainly knew the scriptures and had a background in the scriptures, but also seemed to have an awareness of the extra biblical writings that were being moved around and probably had a better idea, at least a, very potentially had a better idea of where they came from and a better uh, idea of, you know, at least how long they'd been around within the short term of their their community, where they'd come about. So more fascinating information for us to hold. All right. So uh, Jubilees 5, 6 says, and his angels whom he had sent to the earth, he was angry enough to uproot them from all their positions of authority. He told us to tie them up in the depths of the earth. Now they are tied within them and are alone. 
So this verse explains the penalty of those angels who were violated their given estate to order in order to couple with human women. The Lord's wrath was laid about them in two major ways. Firstly, they were relieved of all their proper God-given authority. Second, they were bound in the depths of the earth and are in a state of punishment and isolation there. The idea, this idea is affirmed by both Peter and Jude in the New Testament. Now, to me, the interesting thing is, is that as we look at these verses, and especially as people try to come up with alternate interpretations for Peter and Jude's testimony on the on the topic. Uh, it's fascinating to note how much extra information that I would argue they would be knowledgeable about. They would know, right? We know that Peter and Jude were literate because they wrote, right? They wrote to us. We have their letters. So it's by no means unreasonable to think that they would also be exposed to the various other writings that were important and interesting to the Jewish people. And so the fact that they would make such strong allusions to events that were, I would argue, clear in the Bible, and even more uh, certainly understood and explained by the extra biblical writings, to suggest that they were somehow uh, making such allusions without also clarifying them, if they didn't mean what is what is very obviously meant, is quite a leap, right? It's quite an interpretive leap. Because again, if you were to use or, or be correcting something or being used, using an expression in a way that's not common or in a way that would be misunderstood, you'd most likely explain it. And they don't. They just drop that in there as, yeah, everybody knows this type of information. So um, interestingly enough, uh, here is this is uh oh here's uh here's second peter four two four through eleven just so we have that it says for god if god did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness but reserved for judgment to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but saved noah one of the eight people a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of sodom and gomorrah into ashes condemned them to destruction making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous lot who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds then the lord knows how to deliver the godly out of the temptations out of temptations and sir, to reserve the unjust under punishment until the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the fle flesh in the lust of the uncleanness and despise authority they are presumptuous self-willed they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So we just want to point out Peter calls upon this idea so very easily and so very naturally, and even calls upon us for a great theological application is that God knows when and how to judge uh, unrighteousness and wickedness in due time. And so just as uh, in that antediluvian period, as well as through the uh, uh, situation of Lot, we are waiting upon God to bring about judgment and know that he will in his good time, according to the greatest uh, wisdom. And he also points out this important point that we mentioned at the end of, I think, uh, last night's session, uh, that we are not to be reviling angelic majesties. It is not our job at this point uh, to be judgmental of angels. Uh, we, though we will have some such function in the future, uh, as we see in the New Testament. Uh, Jude 1, 6 and 7, or Jude 6 and 7, likewise says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he had reserved in everlasting chains under uh, darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities around them in a similar manner to these. Having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Um, and again, this points out that that uh, <laughs> very obvious interpretation and the, the historical validity of that interpretation. And even especially both seem to reference Lot, right? This gone after strange flesh. And it puts a, an interesting point into the Sodom and Gomorrah story that, well, certainly their depravity and wickedness and homosexuality were a problem. It seems that another massively great issue was that their desire to um, know sexually the angels, uh, seemingly that they had some idea that they were more, there was something more, they were angels and they wanted to uh, copulate with them in keeping with that kind of uh, last instance that was re recorded in Genesis 6, that they desired that. And that was part of the reason why they deserved their judgment because that wickedness was within them. 
So uh, we move on to Jubilees 7, 21 through 25. It says, for it uh, was on account of these three things that the flood was on the earth, since it was due to fornication that the watchers had illicit intercourse apart from the mandatory mandate of their authority with women. When they married of them, whomever they chose, they committed the first acts of impurity. They fathered as their sons, the Nephilim. All of them were dissimilar from one another and would devour one another. The giant killed the ne Nephil, the Nephil killed the Elio, Elio and the Elio humanity and people their fellows. While everyone sold himself to commitment and justice and shed innocent blood, the earth was filled with injustice. After them, all the animals, birds, and whatever moves about, whatever walks on the earth, much blood was shed on the earth. All the thoughts and wishes of humanity were devoted to thinking up what was useless and wicked all the time. Then the Lord obliterated all from the earth or from the surface of the earth because their actions, because of the blood that they had shed. So we want to notice, well, the biblical account in Genesis places the reason for the floods squarely at the feet of sinful man and the constant wickedness of his every thought. The book of Jubilees makes the central purpose of the flood, the, inter, uh, uh, the intercourse between the watchers and mankind. The acts are noted as being impure and their holy, unholy offspring, unholy offspring are noted for cannibalism, continual violence, and injustice. This was the cause, according to the book of Jubilees, of all the injustice to follow as well as the influence which caused the wickedness of thought and actions among men. So this explains Genesis 6, through nine um, uh, account clearly in keeping uh, with the rest of scripture, right? Uh, so we would argue that certainly this is not information we're given in scripture and however it was dis discerned or received, uh, we wouldn't put it on a par with scripture by any stretch of the imagination, but at least it's an interesting you know, theory to point out that that uh, it gives more detail to the degradation process whereby uh, the angelic or demonic influence and the decay of their goodness or, or the removal of their, their wickedness, rather, seemed to infect and affect every person so that man's every man's thought was wicked and violent at all times. Um, and certainly, uh, again, a, a fascinating little bit of extra information that we would say doesn't conflict with the Bible, but also doesn't uh, isn't doesn't speak with the authority of the Bible. Um, so here is, is Vanderkam on that passage. He says, during the third week of the, this jubilee, 1583 to 89, impure demons began to mislead Noah's grandchildren and make them act foolishly and to destroy them. Then Noah's sons came to their father, Noah, and told him about the demons who were misleading, blinding, and killing his grandchildren. He pay, prayed for before the Lord, his God, and said, God, many spirits, which are in animate beings. Oh, nope, sorry. Wait a minute. This is... Uh, <laughs> Gosh, this isn't Vandergam on the topic. This is verse 10, 10, 1. Goodness gracious. I should have done this PowerPoint more clearly. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, um, and we, uh, the confusion comes because Vandercam's translation in, in the Hermenia uh, translation is, is the best textually as well as uh, for smoothness uh, for good reading. So anyway, let me redo that again with the understanding of the context. This is Jubilees chapter 10, verse 1 and following. During the third week of this jubilee, impure demons began to mislead Noah's grandchildren to make them act foolishly and to destroy them. Then Noah's sons came to their father, Noah, and told him about the demons who were misleading, blinding, and killing his grandchildren. He prayed before the Lord God and said, God of the spirits which, is, uh, which are in all animate beings, you who have shown kindness to me, saved me for, and my sons from the floodwaters, and did not make me perish as you did the people meant for destruction. Because your mercy for me has been large and your kindness to me has been great. May your mercy be lifted over the children of your children, and may the wicked spirits not rule them in order to destroy them from the earth. Now you bless me and my children so that we may increase, become numerous, and fill the earth. As you know, uh, you know how your watchers, the fathers of these spirits, have acted during my lifetime. As for these spirits who have remained alive, shut them up and hold them captive in a place of judgment. May they not dis cause destruction among your servant's sons, my God, for they are dis depraved and were created for the purpose of destroying. May they not rule the spirits of the living, for you alone know their punishment, and may they not have power over the sons of the righteousness from now on forevermore. Then our God told us to imprison each one. When Mestima, the leader of the spirits, came and uh, 
came, he said, Lord Creator, leave some of them before me. Let them listen to me and do everything that I tell them, because none of them is left for me. Uh, if not, because none of them is left for me, I shall not be able to exercise the authority of my will accord among humanity, for they are mean, meant for the purpose of destroying and misleading uh, before my punishment, because the evil of humanity is great. Okay. This is this is uh, where it gets super weird, right? These verses continue to explain that the demonic desire to in, uh, an intent is to pervert and destroy humanity. The captivity of those fallen angels, which violated their domain, is stated, yet there is continuing threat that there would be, be those who would seek to do harm to men. These watchers previously sent to earth to teach and instruct would have been the sole intention, uh, would have the sole intention of continuing their spiritual depravity and destroying the humans who were made in the image of God. Their power, wisdom, and authority and uh, all make it possible for them to dominate the offspring of mankind. And then we get this new interesting character, Mestima. Mestima. So now we get to, to, to Vanderkam again. It says, the scene that follows on in verses 8 through 11 is an unexpected and one of the most bizarre in Second Temple literature. Note that. This is weird, even for the weird stuff. <laughs> Just when it seems as if, Noah's, uh, uh, as if Noah, through God, had averted the crisis and solved the problem, a new character arrives on the scene, Mestima. Ethiopic ju uh, Jubilees, which is, again, this same book in its Ethiopic translation, one of the ways it's been preserved, uh, calls him either by this name alone or by the title the Prince of Mestima, as Eshel observes in the first indication that there, this is a, there is a hierarchy among the evil spirits' demons because Mestima is designated the leader of the spirits. In Jubilees, he will become the chief opponent of the chosen line and thus of Israel. And the angel of the presence who designated the book Moses serving his, as his counterpart. He is the head of the demons or evil spirits and is opposed to the full contingent of the angels of the presence. Mastima is unhappy with the divine solution because it will prevent him from carrying out his appointed tasks. Like Noah, Mastima addresses God directly about it and uses the title Lord Creator. So at the beginning of his speech, he acknowledges the superiority of God and that he must consult with him in order to bring a change. He cannot countermand a divine in order of his own authority. His prayer, like Noah's, is petitionary in nature. But unlike Noah, he makes no appeal to God's past mercies. Instead of praising the Creator, he uses an imperative form, leave some of them before me. God, uh, Noah resorted to imperatives when requested, when requesting a belief, requesting a belief in blessing in verse 4 and telling God what he wanted done to the spirits in verse 5. Otherwise, he used more gentle jussives. That means uh, inviting language rather than commanding language. In verse 3, may your mercy be lifted up over the children uh, of your children. In verse 5, may they not cause destruction. And again, in verse 6, may they not rule and may they not have power. Though he is under uh, God's ultimate control, Mastima speaks from a position of relative authority because he expects the spirits to be completely obedient to him. This is not the occasion which he receives to appointment as leader of the spirits. The writer does not divulge when this happened. Mastima simply demands that some of them remain in his disposal without specifying how many he wants. So, again, this is quite nearful. And I told you it was going to get weird. I promised you. You were warned. It's weird. As Vanderkam points out, is an interesting, uh, an important passage for displaying demonic hierarchy, right? To, to point out that at least in the ancient Jewish perspective, as we've seen uh, evidence of, in the biblical point that there is a, a hierarchy amongst angels and there's also a hierarchy among the demons and that if released, it would remain entirely under his control and command. This, of course, is in keeping with the rest of the biblical teaching on fallen angels, yet it also shows that the fallen angels who followed Satan are subject to him as in Matthew 25, 41, where it's referred to as the devil and his angels. Right. Another important point to note that demons are, are fallen angels. He's, it's not the devil and his demons. It's the devil and his angels here. This point also uh, supports the orthodox biblical position found in the book of Job and elsewhere that the rebellious fallen angels cannot act with absolute freedom. They also are or they are also limited in what they are able to do by the decree of almighty God. Thus, Mestima here, Hata, uh, I would argue, related to Hasatan or the Satan, right? Uh, but given this name, Mestima, cannot force God to do anything. 
but must make request of him. Even if that request may be insistent or demanding, the reality is, is that it is not within uh, Mestima's power to re resist the final and ultimate decree of God. He must make a plea here not to have his side stripped of the various angelic resources. This gives an interesting explanation for the imprisoned versus free demons in the world. The common explanation is that they're not all fallen angels defiled their domain through the sexual congress with human women. However, this text explains that Mistima was able to successfully protest for the release of some of these untold number of them to continue to be on his side and compete, complete his wicked plan. So again, we see this picture of God in discussion with Satan, not totally unlike Job, if indeed we accept that Mestima is a, it was a name or a title given to Satan here. Again, the Prince of Mestima is being an interesting variant on that. But this idea uh, that there is discussion, you know, as almost like, a, you know, councils or, or uh, you know, things flying under the flag, flag of truce in wartime, there are discussions wherein uh, Mestima or, or Satan in this case uh, pro essentially requests uh, certain things of God, knowing that ultimately that God is the final authority. And while he defies him in his will, and while his desire is to do uh, do wickedly, uh, that he does recognize that ultimately he's not going to overcome, uh, overcome God entirely, but only overcome God's will in not making him ruler of this uh, place. Um, yeah, again, Super weird, super interesting, but it's the kind of thing you can be prepared to see uh, if you look through this kind of literature. And this is why it's so important uh, to have a good level head and and good you know kind of uh, people around you to keep in keep you in check. Because again, while this is all very very interesting, we can't have to say again and again it's not scripture. So uh, it's easy to get sucked in though. For sure. Jubilees uh, 18, 9 through 13 says, Then I stood in front of him and in front of the prince of Mestima. The Lord said, Tell him not to let his hand go down on the child. Oh, this is, sorry, this is in reference to Abraham, of course. Uh, tell him not to let his hand go down on the child and not to do anything to him because I have shown him that uh, that shown that he is one who fears the Lord. So I called to him from heaven and said to him, Abraham, Abraham. He was startled and said, yes. And I said to him, do not lay your hands on the child and do not do anything to him because I have show, now shown that you are one who fears the Lord. You have not refused me, your son, your firstborn. The prince of esteem was put to shame. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram. He offered it as a sacrifice instead of his son. Abraham named that place the Lord saw. And so that name is, that is named the Lord saw. It is Mount Zion. Well, there's some interesting parallels that are being drawn. These, this passage adds a very thrilling elephant element to this elephant. It doesn't add a thrilling elephant, although all elephants are thrilling in my opinion. Um, it has a thrilling element, though, to the spiritual warfare aspect that is already a uh, dramatic account in Isaac. If we look at the biblical account, we see that it is really limited primarily to, uh, if not primarily, entirely to the faithfulness of Abraham, his willingness to offer uh, up his son Isaac according to the command of God. We, of course, see incredible parallels to the sacrifice of Christ for sin, that God did what he would not allow Abraham to to do or to suffer uh, for the salvation of the world. He gave up his only begotten son so that we might be uh, saved and forgiven by him. So we look at all that spiritual power, but it's, it's it is an interesting thing that the book of Jubilees, which obviously has doesn't have that uh, parallel and that spiritual reality uh, to look forward to. That is to say, he didn't know that that was going to be the case. Nevertheless, it, it shows this picture of Satan or Mestima here looking on at the at the the scene almost identically to how we would see uh job uh, be be tempted right um so Again, Mestima, which is the name of Jubilees, uses to, uses to refer to the devil, is presented present at the event. The speaker who stood in front of Mestima is the angel of the presence who is dictating all these things to Moses. They sit in characteristic opposition to one another, and the angel of the presence is the one on this account who speaks the words uh, attributed to the Lord in the Genesis account. One noteworthy point about this retelling of jo Genesis account is that it shows that Mestima was put to shame by the events that took place here. It appears that there are many reasons 
in which uh, this event could have put could shame Mestima, he could have wished for the destruction of the messianic line, or he could hope to see that the death of the, and destruction of man for which he celebrates and longs for. However, the soundest perspective is certainly that Mestima did not believe that Abraham would be faithful to the point of offering up his son, his only son, the, the child of promise, Isaac. Yet Abraham was willing to give up that which was most precious and adored to him, proving that he, that man is capable of true faithfulness to God above all things, including himself, his own progeny, that is which dears to him and his desire. So again, um, it is an interesting capacity or fact, uh, uh, idea in Jewish thinking that is that is put forth in the book of Jubilees, that there is always some element in which the angelic world is watching to see uh, whether essentially, <laughs> oh, this is a grotesque way to put it, but who's going to put up po points on the board? Right? Who's gonna? Who is? Who is gonna be proved uh, proved right? Is Abraham gonna be faithful to God, or is Abraham going to uh, defy God? Also, in this, you know, in this difficult thing that God has asked of him. Um, and it, while it is uh, not entirely biblically justified, I think the book of Job certainly does justify the idea, and as well as many other passages, that the angels are watching, and uh, we might say, you know, cheering and, and booing uh, as, as things go on. And every time a person makes a faithful choice of humble and obedient submission to the Lord and desire to glorify him, that heaven cheers, and uh, in the uh, absence of, or in that rejection that... Uh, there's a sigh, you know, um, but it's, it's a fascinating illustration of this kind of thinking extra in an extra biblical way applied. And again, I just would note that if you listen to enough sermons, particularly of uh, people of the sort of American bent, we, we just love telling stories and, and it's just not uncommon to have people dramatize in a sermon. It was a particular trend in the 90s, actually, a weird homiletic trend where we thought that the text was not exciting enough. We had to uh, insert what everyone was thinking, what everyone was doing, and so on and so forth. And that's really what these authors are doing as well. Again, that doesn't excuse the practice, but it does show that there's always this propensity to try to get into the head and find out what things are thinking or feeling or what God is uh, doing or what angels are involved is in this case. But again, it has that idea uh, that is uh, clear throughout throughout ancient Jewish world uh, that there is just a, a great, uh, great example. Many, you know, it is always the case that there is angelic presence seemingly uh, involved in these events. So, uh, you know, you're never alone. <laughs> we know you're never alone because the Lord promised to be with you always. You're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but this idea of the watchers being a pretty regu regular part of life is, is an important feature of this extra biblical theology. Jubilees 1928. Okay, this will be our last one for today. It says, may the spirits of Mestima not rule over you or your descendants to remove you from the following the Lord who is your God from now and forever. So this verse reiterates the sentiment of Noah's prayer in chapter 10 of Jubilees. However, it is a worthwhile issue to mention that the enemy of God and mankind would seek to rule over humans as God's chosen stewards of the earth. The desire of Mestima is to rule man and should he succeed, then they would be removed from the following of the Lord for all of eternity. Eternity. This shows that the ancient Jewish author of this book in no way confused, was no way confused about the existence and purpose of the enemy of God, here known as Mestima, but throughout the rest of the Bible as the accuser, the adversary, and the enemy. And with that, um, oops, I guess I wasn't that far uh, that far from the end, but uh, we'll we'll close up our study again. There are a good handful of other examples from which we could draw. Uh, these were at least some of the interesting ones uh, to me. Let's stop this share here and state. Oops, come on now, come on now, work. Oh. That's sad. Here we go. So two, uh, out of these, uh, this work, Jubilees, puts forth much information that is uh, unconfirmed by Scripture. In many ways, they go beyond what is written to fill in some uh, the many spaces that God's holy silence has left us in the Word. While they dogmatically assert things that Scripture neither confirm nor deny, they do show a marked agreement with much of the nature of the celestial beings as well as their tasks and behaviors. This gives the reader a greater confidence in believing, uh, uh, in believing that the pseudo-epigraphical conception of fallen angels and their ministry is largely, though not perfectly, reliable. 
after a fashion. The concept of demons as fallen angels are doing their work of the primary fallen angel, uh, Mestima or Satan in this case, seems to be consistent throughout both scripture and pseudo-epigraphic pseudo writings and thus cannot be lightly dismissed. In helping us to interpret and understand the unseen world while they are affirmed by Old Testament scriptures, the observations about the devil and his angels will be made clearer in light of the New Testament revelation as we'll look at uh, tomorrow. Uh, but to, uh, tonight, this evening, we get to look at the book of First Enoch, which will be uh, a bunch of fun. Um, I think we're out of time, but I will.